There's a content warning coming up, so if you get irrationally upset about those, please skip ahead five seconds. This video contains discussions about violence and racism. The world is weird, it makes me mad, but at least I get to talk about it with Jose. When last we heard from Lauren Southern, she was stepping away from the online world to focus on real life for a while. I suspected it would be to find herself some credibility via education, possibly a bogus degree in truthology or something like that. I was nearly right, as she returned to British Columbia and enrolled in Fraser Valley University to study philosophy, though within a year she found herself living in Australia, now married with a child. Another prediction I had, and this one seems to have hit a bit closer to the mark, is that she would be rebranding herself as a more moderate voice. To be more precise, not moderate in her politics, they're as far right as ever, but moderate in her tone. Here we are, a year and a half later, with her return to filmmaking with Crossfire, a movie responding to the latest wave of political unrest in the United States about policing in predominantly black communities. If you are blessed enough to not have heard of Lauren Southern, I recommend checking out my videos about her to get a sense of her history. The short version is, she's an activist posing as a journalist who has transitioned to making feature-length movies that are actually thinly veiled works of propaganda. While I strongly suspected Lauren Southern was aware she was deceiving her audience, in a recent interview her director for the two movies Farmlands and Borderless, Kaylin Robertson, confirmed it. Talking about the genocide at the end, that's a lie. Saying that there is no, saying that there was a white genocide coming in South Africa is something that all three of us knew wasn't true. But we said to appease the right, because you have to tick all the boxes. Robertson, who has left the far right since making the movies, was de-radicalized through the filming of Borderless, one of the movies he made with Lauren Southern, and suspected she would leave the scene as well. A lot of the people that we were demonizing turned out to be like completely normal refugee, you know, refugees, women and children. And so we went through that de-radicalization process and we were wrong about so many things. It wasn't feeling responsible, but it was like being part of the same problem that got us here in the beginning, which was, we thought, which was terrorism. It was extremist Islam, it was extremist ideologies. And now, for some reason, we found ourselves on the same side of people doing the same thing part of the problem. It's one of the main reasons I would say, like as well as having a kid, that Lauren disappeared for a year, because that happened and she was like, this is too much. And obviously it's the reason that I never came back. Upon returning from her break, Southern released a lengthy video explaining how she wanted to get some perspective and rethink her approach to politics. This whole mess, this whole just disaster that I was a part of, it is something that I... I began realizing in people around me, and then I started to see within myself as well that I was actively assisting in creating this culture of entertainment and hot take politics. She makes reference to the finale of our Borderless movie and how she grew to understand looking at both sides of an issue. If anyone is familiar with my video on Borderless, you'll realize how completely hollow this statement is because her initial position of keeping immigrants out of Europe was completely unchanged. The only difference is now she wants to turn them away with a frowny face because she feels bad about it. She framed it as a hard truth in a film filled with lies. The irony is stunning. But there's one clip from this video I need to highlight. I am growing as a person. I don't know everything and I am excited to learn more. And I want to let my work speak for me going forward. If anything, I'd say I've taken the real life pill. I think people are multidimensional, complex beings and they are worthy of trying to understand. So coming back into media, I really want to go forward approaching the world with a genuine open mind, open to both the rational and emotional aspects of being human. Not facts over feelings, but facts and feelings, because facts help us operate in this world, but love and compassion are what make it worthwhile. I genuinely like a lot of what she said here. Facts and feelings aren't always in competition, and it's important to remind people of the human element of stories we see in headlines. In the interests of hoping someone can change and become a better person, I am going to try and watch this documentary with an open mind. And if I can find that Lauren Southern has decided to become a more honest filmmaker, I would genuinely celebrate that. In her previous movies, she lied about a man's death, exploiting the grief of his daughter. She lied about groups of refugees secretly being terrorists. And she completely ignored any and all meaningful discussion of statistics. I'm going to see if Lauren Southern really has taken the uh, real life pill and decided to become a real journalist. For Crossfire, Lauren Southern partnered with Scooter Downey, who recently worked with Mike Cernovich on his movie Hoaxed. 
The movie opens with a lot of flashy noises and visuals, symbolizing the barrage of information from the mainstream media, and the movie sets itself up as an opposition, framing the news as propaganda. Erase the images. Ignore the demands of propaganda. It's designed to create the impression that the movie will cut through the noise to deliver the truth, like the ringing of a church bell, symbolized by the ringing of a church bell. Listen. And it pulls in the viewer with this closer. If you won't listen to their stories, who will listen to yours? It's a stirring opening, one that lets the viewer know there's a danger in the world, and one that could be targeting them next. Lauren Southern's charmless narration here seems strangely out of place in the production, and as we'll see throughout this movie, her presence is much more low-key than her previous movies. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, most of these interviews appear to have been filmed by other people, with an interviewer not shown on screen. The language used to describe the subject of the movie is vague. It presents itself as a balanced look at the controversy around police violence against black Americans, but the truth is, it's far more concerned with defending the police. After the introduction, we are shown an abridged history of what led to the 2020 Black Lives Matter demonstrations. We see David James, president of Louisville Metro Council, telling a story about the civil rights movement and the brutality of cops against demonstrators. Strangely, there's no real condemnation of the actions of police from the narration of the movie, and it ends on this note. I didn't really like police, so I wanted to become a police officer to stop police officers from doing things to people that look like me. The discussion then immediately shifts focus on the role riots played in the civil rights movement. There's a line in this history section that's particularly emphasized. Every action provokes a reaction. The juxtaposition here is interesting. The response we see from someone in the black community to bad policing is to join them and try to make them better. The response from police to violence in the black community is to intensify their efforts. The history lesson section of Crossfire includes plenty of strange revisions. Here's one example of Nixon's election being presented like this. Richard Nixon was elected on a promise of law and order, and the country responded to the growing problem of violence, crime, and rioting with SWAT teams, no-knock raids, and the beginnings of the war on drugs. The opposite of what the rioters wanted. That brief mention of the war on drugs and how it impacted black communities is important. The movie presents it as a logical response to the violence on the streets, how every action provokes a reaction. According to John Ehrlichman, Nixon's aide on domestic affairs, the war on drugs wasn't simply a response to drug use in America. Rather, he describes it like this. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Crossfire isn't interested in this side of history, though, and it takes us through the intervening decades in similar fashion, dipping into small moments of time and stripping away all nuance. And for an even clearer indication of what kind of movie this is, we meet one of the major talking heads in the movie, Mike Cernovich. If you're unfamiliar with who Mike Cernovich is, congratulations! He's formerly affiliated with the alt-right and probably most famous for pushing the absurdly untrue Pizzagate conspiracy theory. If you're curious about his opinions on black people, here are some statements he's made that should make his feelings clear. Cernovich is known for having a loose connection to the truth, which makes him a curious subject for any fact-based discussion on anything. But as we'll soon see, he's the sort of subject that's a perfect fit for a movie like Crossfire. Here's an example of the commentary we get from Cernovich. We have an under-incarceration problem. I did not say that incorrectly. Under. We don't throw enough habitual criminals in prison for life. I fully support the three strikes laws. Cernovich never tells us where these stats are coming from or what informs his opinions. In a 2015 report from the Brennan Center for Justice, nine different factors for the crime drop in the 1990s are pictured, and six in the 2000s. Incarceration accounts for no more than 7% of the drop in crime in the 1990s and 1% in the 2000s. An increase in police is credited with, at most, a 10% drop in crime in the 1990s. 
As you can see, the biggest segment in each of these two breakdowns are a collection of unknown factors, and this seems to reflect much of the scholarship on the subject. Most researchers in the field seem to be in agreement that, while many theories are presented, there's no widespread agreement on any one or two factors that are chiefly responsible for the drop in crime over the last few decades. The competing theories range from everything to the reduction of lead in the atmosphere to video games keeping teens off street corners. Incarceration does not seem to have played a large effect on crime rates, and the strategies like broken window policing are not nearly as effective as they are often touted as being. Crossfire's certainty that cops and prisons are what keep people safe is at the core of its message, and the next phase of the movie introduces us to its implicit heroes, the police. Only ostensibly taking a balanced approach, this movie takes a very clear pro-cop stance throughout. The second part makes that apparently clear when we meet several police officers interviewed for this movie. Most of them go by pseudonyms, including Connor, Johnny Law, and Captain America. Which is, I guess, better than The Punisher. This section humanizes police officers, telling their personal stories of horror on the job. And I think it's useful insofar that it reminds us that, though policing itself is an institution with deep flaws, we can't write off the people who act within the institution as inhuman cogs in a machine of oppression. A number of stories are told detailing the traumas police officers face while on the job. The conclusion it draws is that police officers are in need of counseling. Which, yes, sounds like a good idea for anyone with a job where they might regularly confront horrible situations. But if being a cop is so psychologically damaging, doesn't that perhaps suggest something about the job itself that should be changed on a more fundamental level? that anyone has to experience these traumas, and to such an extent that it has lasting psychological damage, suggests to me that policing needs to be restructured, whether it be through division of duties or introducing mental health checks. And these changes wouldn't just be for the sake of the communities impacted by bad policing, but the people themselves within the police department would also benefit from them. One of the few officers whose full name we get is Corey Pegues, who you might be surprised to find out is a police officer, since the opening minutes of the movie introduce him as the gangbanger. Pegues did in fact deal drugs, but in this movie he's speaking not just as a former drug dealer, but as someone who spent 21 years working as a police officer, becoming deputy inspector of the 67th precinct in New York City. Of all the subjects interviewed, Pegues also seems to be the most interesting, often offering a more nuanced perspective of policing. Though something strange happens with his commentary. Here's one example where he mentions a lack of training for talking people down. They don't teach you down in school, though. You got to be able to talk to people. You can't shoot your way out every single time. You can't lock everybody up. So what else are you going to do? And it's immediately followed by this. Uh, at least in my agency, I, I have more training than I know what to do with. Or when we hear Pegues talk about holding bad cops accountable. Cops are constantly saying, we have a bunch of good cops, but the civilians are not seeing it because all we see is bad cops. Eric Garner, 12 cops on the scene, nobody intervened. George Floyd, four cops on the scene, nobody intervened. You know, I'm pushing this bystander law, meaning if there's a cop on the scene where another cop commits a crime, that cop should be terminated. You know, you gotta speak up. When something happens, you gotta do something about it. And it's immediately followed by a number of PR events of cops condemning bad actors. As if to say the changes being alluded to are unnecessary, as if police departments already hold bad cops accountable. Anything defense all about that. The video that was seen was horrific. Horrible. Disturbing. I am personally disgusted. I think this isn't for every statement Peguess makes, but it is one I noticed that happens every time he wanted to criticize something in modern day policing. This happens a lot in the movie. Criticisms leveled at police, what few that there are, are immediately contradicted. But as we'll see in the next section, this is never true when it comes to those who the movie takes a less friendly perspective towards. Walter Hawk Newsom is interviewed as a voice for the black community, specifically Black Lives Matter. He offers a brief alternative to policing, describing it as the front line for upholding white supremacy, and his comments immediately lead to images of riots and people, including himself, making violent threats to reshape society. We tried peaceful protesting, we tried in every different direction, and this is our, this is our last resort. Give black people their rights or we will burn this country to ashes. The criticisms of police are, of course, immediately countered by how wonderful and helpful police are. There's some very, very, very good cops. 
in America. Though more importantly, the depiction of Black Lives Matter here is one that emphasizes them as a violent group. Watching this video, you wouldn't realize that 93% of BLM demonstrations in 2020 were peaceful. This is, of course, not common knowledge, as polling from June of 2020 indicated that 42% of people believe that most protesters associated with the BLM movement are trying to incite violence or destroy property. This is a stereotype the movie is happy to feed into, and its choice of Newsom as an interview subject was very deliberate. The comment Newsom made about burning the country to ashes was retweeted by former President Trump in June of 2020, claiming that Newsom was speaking as the leader of BLM. In response, a press release from the Black Lives Matter Global Network clarified that Newsom has no relation to the organization and is not the president of BLM or any of its chapters, citing that any group that wishes to be affiliated with BLM must follow its principles and code of ethics. Newsom also has a history of appearing on lots of right-wing media outlets. He seems to be the right-wing's favorite choice when it comes to finding a supposed representative for Black Lives Matter. It seems clear that Crossfire wanted to get someone they could say was a member of BLM to promote the most violent rhetoric possible, to go along with all the violent images they could find, because the movie wants its audience to think of BLM as a violent organization, in spite of what data might otherwise say. Visuals of the movie also pair the goals with BLM, according to Newsom, with policy proposals from the Democratic Party, in an obvious effort to make the supposedly violent BLM synonymous with the Democrats. BLM is further interrogated as the movie dares to dive into the reality of crime in black neighborhoods. This is where things start really getting off the rails. We see a handful of worthwhile ideas on improving policing, such as civilian oversight committees and mandatory body cameras. These ideas get about 30 seconds of airtime before the emphasis shifts away from improving policing and intends spending the next 30 minutes on why there are higher crime rates within predominantly black communities. Here we meet our next supposed expert, Colin Flaherty. Flaherty is a relatively minor figure in the right-wing space, having been a writer for the conspiracy theory-laden World Net Daily, and he's notably the author of the 2012 book titled White Girl Bleed a Lot, The Return of Racial Violence to America and How the Media Ignore It. He has a well-documented history of twisting stories to fit his narrative of white people under attack by black people. According to Alex Perrine, White Girl Bleed a Lot uses anecdotes while denying the real crime statistics that paint anti-white crimes to be far less common than anti-black ones. And this is true in the most recent FBI stats from 2019. Flaherty is brought for a barrage of clips and a few misleading stats to suggest that white people are constantly under threat from black people. The stats are easy enough to address, as they're highly selective. The ones focusing on black-on-black -black crime, for instance, are mundane, as stats on white-on-white -white crime are similar. Most American communities aren't terribly diverse, and people are far more likely to commit crimes within their own communities. And we get subtle sleight-of-hand statistics like this one. Twice as many whites as blacks are killed by police. According to recent census data, white Americans make up 60.1% of the population of the United States, while black Americans make up 13.4%. So when it comes to the number of Americans shot by police, the actual number of white Americans shot might be twice as high as black Americans, but there are more than five times as many white Americans than there are black Americans in the United States, so the likelihood of being shot by a police officer is much higher for black Americans. It's the difference between looking at absolute numbers and proportional ones. If the two population sizes were equal, it would make sense, but since there's a disparity, to look at the actual numbers is very misleading when it comes to which community is more likely to be impacted by police violence. The most problematic stats are ones like this, though. 85 to 95 percent of interracial crimes and violence were black on white. I don't know where this stat comes from or how it can even be sourced. The closest example I could find was this meme shared by former President Trump before he was elected in 2016, claiming that 81% of white victims of homicide were killed by black people. The actual figure is closer to 17%. And what seems like an admission of the shaky ground stats play in this narrative about the threat of crime in black communities, we get a nice section about how the stats aren't trustworthy anyway. So as bad as the crime numbers are, the real numbers are way, way worse. And the movie speeds through snippets of how the books are being cooked to downplay the crime numbers. Crossfire moves at a breakneck pace here, never dwelling on any piece of evidence for too long. We see the flash of an article from 2011, or a news interview from 2018, 
just enough to suggest that this problem is widespread and that crime stats can't be trusted. How long has this been going on, and just how widespread is it? We never get answers to questions like those, and it's difficult to even know how to respond to an argument predicated on a few anecdotes only vaguely described. Pew Research published an article about the drop in crime over the last few decades. The Bureau of Justice conducts an annual survey looking at how many crimes get reported to law enforcement. The number has stayed fairly steady at roughly 40% for violent offenses and 32% for property crimes. The solve rate has similarly stayed at the same rate for both types of crimes. These stats, of course, don't take into account that police themselves are misrepresenting their numbers, but reports of cops massaging stats have existed since stats have been introduced in policing in the 1990s. We need more than a few anecdotes to suggest that this practice is increasing, or is responsible for the overall drop in crime, particularly if we can observe that the behaviors of citizens and police are relatively stable. The stories were presented also involve different police departments at different times. For the drop in crime to be a product of stats being manipulated, it would require police departments across the country to be increasingly manipulating stats downward, which is a level of coordination that implies a conspiracy this movie presents no credible evidence of. Though we do have a bit of conspiracy stuff coming, don't worry. There's less to debunk here because there isn't much of anything in this section about crime stats. We get a handful of misleading ones and then we're told they can't be trusted. The audience is instead expected to trust Crossfire's endless barrage of context-free anecdotes. Ironically, a few minutes later we get a glowing review of Comstat and how stats are an effective tool for knowing what neighborhoods should be targeted by policing. Many large police departments use data, they have data analysts. That's really what Comstat is, is analyzing the data, pinpointing the problem, and vigorous follow-up. Crime stats are apparently helpful when it comes to figuring out which communities should be most aggressively policed. And you can probably guess that the communities Crossfire is talking about are the ones that are predominantly populated by racial minorities. One of the movie's talking heads I haven't touched on much is John Paul Wright, a criminologist from the University of Cincinnati. Wright is the only academic extensively featured in the documentary, and again, it's an interesting choice of someone to highlight. His area of expertise is biosocial criminology, and in 2017 he wrote a lengthy article about the problem of a lack of ideological diversity in criminology, specifically the lack of conservatives in the field. So a lot of my work has been in understanding uh, human violence, patterns of human violence, uh, some of the biological predispositions to violence, some of the characterological issues to violence, and then how that plays out in a social environment. And it's worth noting that Lauren Southern echoes this in the narration when she says, No one is born a criminal. In the interplay of nature and nurture, better nurture can help shape nature. And if we were talking about human beings broadly, sure, the idea that biology might explain characteristics leading to deviant behavior isn't controversial at all. There is a wide range of biological realities across the human species. But if we rewind the documentary, this tempered take was preceded by something far more provocative. Is there a connection between these minority neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, and higher crime? And I don't know. Somebody much smarter than me needs to figure that one out because I don't know what the answer to that is. So a lot of my work has been in understanding uh, human violence, patterns of human violence, questioning why minority communities are more prone to crime, and then immediately discussing how biology factors into that claim makes a clear connection to race and criminal behavior. It's at best incoherent, and at worst reveals that this movie is pushing a race realism perspective, suggesting that Black and Hispanic Americans are biologically predisposed to becoming criminals. It's always worth repeating that race is a social construct and has no meaningful basis in biological categorization. While physical differences in people can be observed, it's a fairly mainstream position in biology to say that these differences are superficial and don't represent a fundamental biological difference within and between different racial groups. After the biological explanation for crime, we drift to vague assertions about the black community, such as a lack of personal responsibility or irresponsible parenting. And I call these mutant parents, okay, the ones that defend the indefensible. Your son has beaten this woman up, set her on fire, and killed her, and you are saying he's a good boy. This is epidemic in the black community, rescuing, blaming others. 
And even more dramatic, the problem is the community at large. I'll counsel a black felon, you know, in prison. I'll ask him, where do you get this whole thing about white people? You even admitted you weren't even around them. Where do you, I said, where do you learn this? And they'll say, in church, at home, elders on the street. Some of the answers this movie is landing on regarding the impact and magnitude of policing on the black community is that black people have a noxious culture and may just be genetically predisposed to being criminals. I want to take a few moments to provide some contrary information. In 2018, the Sentencing Project highlighted a number of ways in which certain racial groups face greater challenges within the legal system. Some examples include drug-free school zone laws, which disproportionately target neighborhoods in black and Hispanic communities, or harsher sentencing for black or Hispanic offenders compared to similar white offenders. There are also a few choice stats that highlight these discrepancies. But a broader view on the challenges facing minority communities would examine systemic racism. That is, not the actions of individual actors who may be explicitly or implicitly racist, but the complex historical and socioeconomic realities for people of color within the United States. Crossfire makes an attempt at understanding this when it addresses critical race theory. Here's how it's defined in the movie. Uh, critical race theory is the idea that all of our institutions are all designed to maintain white supremacy. They really need to be kind of completely dismantled to uh, liberate uh, the oppressed people. So the music really highlights how they want the viewer to think of critical race theory. It even pairs it with some protesters wanting to protect black criminals to make it explicitly clear that this isn't going to be a very kind hearing for critical race theory. It even redefines it for us a few moments later. So when we talk about critical race theory, that's the idea that black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. And in less than two minutes, the movie takes us from that to this. Critical theory is nothing but an unremitting attack on all the norms of the West, on all our traditions and our institutions. There was to be a new revolution, a cultural revolution. Quite a trip, huh? Critical race theory isn't just wrong, it's a plot by communists to destroy the nuclear family. This is how the movie pushes aside any sort of systemic critique that might explain why certain communities are facing harsher policing than others. A detailed rundown of critical race theory is far too big a topic for this video, but there was a nice summary of it by Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the founding scholars of CRT and the executive director and co-founder of the African American Policy Forum. She describes it as a practice, a way of seeing how the fiction of race has been transformed into concrete racial inequities. It's an approach to grappling with a history of white supremacy that rejects the belief that what's in the past is in the past, and that the laws and systems that grow from the past are detached from it. A nice real-world example can be read in an article from Time magazine. Consider the fact that a disproportionate amount of people from Black and Latinx communities are being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the CDC, Black and Latinx people are twice as likely to die from the virus as white people. A person considering that stat in a vacuum might assume that genetic or biological factors are to blame, a false conclusion that insinuates that there is something inherently wrong with Black and Latinx bodies. However, a person applying a critical race theory framework to this issue would also ask how historical racism, which manifests today in everything from access to clean air to treatment by medical professionals, might be influencing this statistic and would thus arrive at a much more complete and nuanced explanation. And that's a way in which critical race theory can provide a new perspective to more adequately inform our understanding of the world. It isn't some communist plot to destroy the nuclear family, it's simply a lens which we can look through to understand the world in a more nuanced way. Back to Crossfire though, at this point in the movie, the counterports are being very effectively silenced and it's time for the true villains to take the stage. It's time for a discussion of Antifa. Antifa! Our first speaker on the subject of Antifa is Elijah Schaefer, a reporter working for Glenn Beck's Blaze TV, which is, unsurprisingly, another conservative outlet. Most recently, he was in the news for embedding himself amongst the group that stormed the Capitol building on January 6th, 2021, where he tweeted a photo of Nancy Pelosi's private emails. It's not tough to guess which side of the political spectrum he sympathizes with. Schaefer's role in this section is to breathlessly describe how incredibly violent and dangerous Antifa are. That's a level of mental illness 
that I would hope would be isolated to a few individuals, but I'm quickly finding is a greater swath of the United States of America, and especially these groups like BLM and Antifa, than I would have hoped was realistic. I'm consistently impressed by his ability to be impossibly shocked at all times. Another talking head for this section is Jack Murphy, formerly John Goldman, author of Democrat to Deplorable, Why 9 Million Obama Voters Ditch the Democrats and Embrace Donald Trump. Murphy tells a story about how Antifa doxed him and ruined his life. He describes it like this. But Antifa figured out where I worked. They swarmed on my employer's Twitter feed. There I was, a Nazi, just because I was hanging out with other people that they decided to call Nazis as well. The unnamed associate here was Mike Cernovich, who was certainly a member of the alt-right at the time. And it wasn't just his associations that had gotten Jack Murphy in trouble. He had also been anonymously running a blog with excerpts such as these. I've reprinted a few, and you can read some of his opinions of feminists and people of color. Our third talking head in this section is Jack Posobiec, a lean purveyor of bogus conspiracy theories. Some of the more relevant examples include spreading a lie that Antifa may have derailed a train, and that pipe bombs were planted at a Korean War memorial in Washington, D.C. during a protest. In addition to his long history of fabricating stories, he's also made a number of racist and anti-Semitic remarks, such as using the triple parentheses to refer to Jewish people. These are the three voices this movie has chosen to elevate when it comes to discussing Antifa. And unsurprisingly, no one from Antifa was interviewed for this supposedly balanced documentary. When discussing Antifa, the speakers present them as They're very not good looking people. A lot of them have weird facial symmetry. They, they look distorted. If you look at their arrest pictures, this is a very unattractive, unkept group of people. And because of course these people are supposedly not acting of their own free will, they're presented as being manipulated by some shadowy group. Idiots who go in to join the cause, they're the ones who are being put forward to get hurt. That's the average dumb recruit that they, they bring in. Now the average Antifa leader is probably someone in their 50s or 60s planning this. Much like critical race theory, Antifa is also presented as a threat created by communists. But on the American side, we find a direct lineage of Antifa and BLM from the old uh, communist revolution. And the relationship between Antifa and Black Lives Matter is summed up like this. The Black Lives Matter and Antifa are two different networks with, with two different origins, but they're, they're uh, allies together for a larger goal of really just, again, attacking the system. This guy in the glasses is J. Michael Waller from the Center for Security Policy, a far-right think tank that has promoted a number of conspiracy theories, such as former President Obama's administration being filled with members of the Muslim Brotherhood. In a movie where the softest whisper of improving police training is immediately contradicted, we're given 30 minutes of presenting Antifa as one of the most dangerous terrorist groups in the United States without the slightest attempt of balance. The movie spends some time on the murder of Aaron Danielson, a Trump supporter murdered by Michael Rinell, a member of Antifa. This was, by the way, the first time someone who was a part of Antifa was charged with a politically motivated homicide in 25 years. After committing the murder, Rinell was confronted by police a few days later and was fatally shot. Posobiec and Murphy suggest that the murder of Danielson wasn't the work of a lone actor. We see Murphy pour over some shaky video to say that this was some kind of coordinated effort by an Antifa hit squad. There's a guy on a skateboard two feet away from the shooting, doesn't even flinch. There's a girl in front of him, they don't even flinch. Both these cars right here, they don't go anywhere. The police have yet to arrest anyone for this murder with the main suspect dead, so it seems that they have come to a very different conclusion than this being the work of some kind of Antifa hit squad. But what does one even say to this? Murphy is trying to present the idea that someone not acting in whatever way he deems normal to seeing someone shot in front of them means they're part of some kind of hit squad. Like these people driving up to check on the victim, he thinks that they're looking for shell casings possibly. I don't know what makes him an expert on any of this other than he has the sort of paranoia that this movie wants to push out there in order to make Antifa look as dangerous as possible. He calls almost everyone in this shot a member of Antifa at some point, and then most ridiculously he says this. This is the escalation that we have seen. This is 
my experience of an information attack, of a character assassination, has now evolved and grown into actual on the street, real world murders. This is some embarrassing paranoia that is also completely offensive. Regardless of this guy's politics, Danielson didn't deserve to be shot and killed on the street like that. It was a terrible crime. In no way is it similar to Murphy being outed for writing a hateful blog under a pseudonym. It's not even close. And the movie then moves on to discussing Kyle Rittenhouse. Honestly, I have very little stamina for talking about the whole Rittenhouse situation, so if you want a breakdown of what happened, I recommend this video by ThoughtSlime. It does a good job of summaring up the events of that day. Here's how Posobiec describes Kyle Rittenhouse driving across state lines to fight alongside a militia defending stores from Black Lives Matter. We shouldn't have anyone feel the need that they need to step up and, pro and protect their community because the government isn't doing its job. That's the social contract. Rittenhouse's defense highlights the problems within the system that led to his actions. It's amazing how not a single person in Black Lives Matter, Antifa, or any other group whose behavior is presented as awful in this movie gets the same treatment. I think what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse is very tragic. I think it's very sad to see that kind of breakdown in our political structure and in our governance, where it comes to the point that a 17-year-old kid feels that it's his responsibility to stand up for a community that's being burned, that's being attacked, because it doesn't seem like anybody else cares. Well, someone is supposed to care, and that someone is the government. A systemic explanation only exists when it's someone they want to defend. I'm perfectly happy to say there are systemic reasons that explain Rittenhouse's behavior. I just wish they would be more consistent and apply that standard to everyone instead of falling back on personal responsibility or ugh, genetics. Schaefer takes a similar tone, adding some nuance to the criticism of the system, saying it hasn't taken care of the problem of BLM and Antifa. This man is dead because we have not dealt with the problem of Black Lives Matter and Antifa and we've let it fester. For those who prefer a more grounded take on the threat of violence related to protests, here's a revealing opening line in an article from The Guardian. White supremacists and other right-wing extremists have been responsible for 67% of domestic terror attacks and plots so far this year, with at least half of that violence targeting protesters. In this anti-Antifa segment, we were told about one member of Antifa murdering Aaron Danielson, and then Kyle Rittenhouse murdering two protesters supporting Black Lives Matter. Even in this movie, the body count shows protesters are more likely to be killed than counter-protesters. For a movie supposedly taking a balanced look at the 2020 Black Lives Matter protest, there is also no mention of protesters being attacked by the Proud Boys or other groups that crashed several protests. The movie ignores the fact that most protests were peaceful, and when looking at those that were violent, it only considers violence caused by those it wants to connect to Black Lives Matter. The movie does highlight shop owners who have lost their livelihood due to the protests, and while I certainly don't condone violence, this movie uses them as a stepping stone for advancing a much bigger narrative, one that deflects criticism away from police and blames black communities alone for the problems of crime within them, the harsh policing that that brings, and it presents Black Lives Matter and Antifa as the most dangerous activists in the country. After the section on Antifa, the remaining 20 minutes of the movie devolves into a montage of pro-cop love, and we get some weird references to George Soros being behind all of this. Just a bit of anti-Semitic dog whistling to round out the movie. And then it wraps up with some fearfulness about a godless world. You have strong men of God versus weak men of nothing. I haven't spoken much of the role religion plays in this movie. Lauren Southern's work has never been particularly religious at all, unless it was attacking Muslims. But this movie has a few subtle religious bits scattered throughout it. There is always the tension to um, acquiesce to the flow of culture. But God is uh, the, the rock of our salvation. Yeah. They, they don't believe in God and they are atheist. And I, I know that I would not have, have made it this far in, in this career without God guiding me. I suspect the reason these were included because it was produced with the help of the Lively Journal Society, a nonprofit that produces faith based content. I'm not going to say that they're being scammed because I'm not terribly familiar with the group, 
but all the references to religion here feel like they were stapled on to a movie that clearly has little to do with religion. And that brings us to the final section of the movie, a brief monologue from Lauren Southern herself. This is a long, rambling section where she goes over what we already saw in this movie. She sums up her perspective of activists here. To believe one race is responsible for all of the suffering in other is to remove one's own ability to take personal responsibility and improve their own life, to choose their own fate, and to fix their communities. This is a gross mischaracterization of one side of the debate. It doesn't meaningfully engage with the argument that historic racism has an impact on the modern day. It's a misunderstanding of a systemic critique and framing it as an attack on individual white people. Lauren Southern has taken a very clear side in this documentary. It's unabashedly pro-cop. What I take issue with is the constant misrepresentation of history, stats, and recent news stories. Its interview subjects are overwhelmingly right-wing, often with histories of lies and distortion. For a movie that's supposedly about police violence in black communities, it spends no time talking to the victims or families of victims of police violence. And it spends way too much time talking about Antifa. While writing this script, one of the big problems I had was keeping track of every little point that was raised. Every snippet of footage or anecdote that was told takes so much time to debunk that I simply don't have the resources to produce a three-hour response going through everything. There were also subjects like systemic racism I only have a modest knowledge of. That's the problem with such a wide span of ignorance. It would take a team of experts to effectively debunk all of it. The movie plows through all these subjects and stories with absolute certainty of its purpose, even though it's constantly getting things wrong. It believes, with absolute certainty, that there is nothing wrong with the policing of black communities, aside from the very rare bad cop who will surely be punished, and issues of crime are failures of personal responsibility detached from history, and systemic critiques are part of some kind of communist plot. The problem is that Crossfire does a poor job of evidencing any of these claims. It's a loud, obnoxious waste of time. One of the consolations I've had about this movie is that the reaction to it has largely been indifferent. Looking at the four videos released on Lauren Southern's YouTube channel, views overall were relatively tepid, with the highest performing video, announcing Crossfire's release, struggling to get past 80,000 views. In comparison, the video announcing Borderless, has over 300,000 views, which is more views than all the Crossfire teaser videos combined. And some videos promoting farmlands have over 1 million views. While these older videos have the advantage of being online for longer, screen craps from my previous Lauren Southern videos show that they were stronger performers even back then. Looking on Twitter, the announcement for Crossfire's release has a mere 1.4 thousand likes. And when Lauren Southern asked her Twitter followers if they had watched the movie, less than a third said they had. But more telling is that, of Southern's 365,000 followers, just under 2,500 people bothered to vote at all. Crossfire is embedded on a private website, so I have no idea how many people have actually watched this movie. Not being on YouTube is undoubtedly hurting it, but I suspect another factor here is that Lauren Southern herself has become increasingly irrelevant. Following the smash success of Farmlands, Borderless got half as many views, in spite of the broader appeal of its subject matter, and it looks like Crossfire is performing even more poorly than Borderless had. Whether it was a year off, or her return being greeted with some vicious infighting from certain elements of the right, it seems Lauren Southern's relevance has taken a hit. She isn't completely irrelevant, of course, but she doesn't seem to be held in the high regard within her circles the way she had previously been. Shortly after her return, a movie called White Noise, produced by The Atlantic, was released. In it, Southern is one of three subjects, the other two being Richard Spencer and Mike Cernovich, who were riding the wave of right-wing populism that followed the election of Donald Trump in 2016. The footage captures a behind-the-scenes look at their respective lives, and in all three cases, we see people who live with a lot of sadness. In Lauren Southern's case, it seems to come from the constant sexual harassment from men in right-wing circles and a lack of a private personal life. Southern had a very public falling out with the director of the movie, Daniel Lombroso, after she learned the movie included a surreptitious recording of her being propositioned by Gavin McInnes. Scenes like the one where she is overwhelmed by having to, once again, turn down a man aggressively propositioning her make me feel a bit sorry for her. <laughs> Some help. 
now. Lauren never comes to the realization that the space she's in is so toxic and destructive, and so she becomes a tool for it. Near the end of White Noise, Southern is asked if she thinks her rhetoric has contributed to the rise of hate crimes in the United States. So if anything I've said has contributed to that, it was because someone misinterpreted me. In Christchurch, when a man murdered 51 people inside of two mosques, his manifesto had the exact same title as one of Lauren Southern's videos, The Great Replacement. Though she hardly coined the term, and we have no reason to believe this one video inspired the shooting, it does reveal the space her work is occupying, and the style of rhetoric she shares with people. Going back to Caleb Robertson's interview, it seems that Southern is, to some degree, aware of this fact, and still she persists in her work. But throughout White Noise, I didn't see some kind of malevolent mastermind. I saw a confused young woman who has internalized a lot of hateful rhetoric, who seems completely detached on the impact it has in the real world. She may wish to break free of this circle and enter the world of respectable journalism, but Crossfire is absolutely not a step in that direction. This movie is supposedly a balanced look at the issue of policing in the United States, and maybe in Lauren Southern's case she truly believes that. But this movie is still filled with distortions, lies, misinformation, and a general lack of understanding of any of the criticism it's supposedly addressing. It's a flashy mess that will, hopefully, soon be forgotten. This is my third video about Lauren Southern in as many years, and to be honest, I'm kind of a little tired of talking about her. You might have been able to tell by my tone at the end there, I kind of just feel sorry for her. She doesn't seem to realize that the things she believes leads to the very terrible people who are all around her. If she continues her slide out of relevancy, I doubt I'll cover any of her work in the future. And honestly, I think this fixation on her as a public figure in some ways does more harm than good. She's not pushing out any meaningful message that's having a traumatic impact. So my time is probably better spent looking at other figures on the right or narratives that have taken hold in the popular discourse. Although Lauren has recently returned to producing hot take videos for her YouTube channel, so maybe that'll restore her former illustrious status. I want to thank my lovely patrons who help keep me doing this on YouTube. I'm actually considering maybe doing this full time. If you're someone who wants to see me increase my output on this channel, do consider becoming a patron or a member. You'll get your name in the credits like these lovely people. You also get early access to my videos, download links to my theme songs. If you would like to support my videos in a non-monetary manner, you can like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Thank you so much for watching.